Good morning, everybody. Well, so if, if you were here in church on Sunday, I don't think there's really a need for us to uh, discuss the next verses. <laughs> that, that was uh, quite a coincidence that the very text appointed for this past Sunday is exactly where we left off in the John class. Uh, so we're in John chapter 16, and I um, guess we have a, just a little bit more to say uh, about uh, verses 12 to 15 before moving into this next section beginning in, in 16. Let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that in your word you reveal to us your great love for us through your son Jesus. And uh, we know uh, from Jesus himself that all the scriptures bear witness about him. And so we pray that as we study these next verses in the Gospel of John that our faith in Jesus might be strengthened and our love for one another grow. And all this uh, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Set over here. So in verse 12, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth, for he'll not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And we've, we've, we've talked about this uh, a little bit uh, already, but you know, very simply, it's, it's the third article of the creed. It's in the meaning in the catechism. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So we have, when we talk about the three persons of the Trinity, we can ask, what is each person's distinctive work? Not in isolation, it's not as though the other two persons don't participate in the other person's work, but as scripture by and large talks about the persons distinctively, we associate with each person a distinctive work. What is the Father's distinctive work? Creation. We think of the Father as the Creator. What is the Son's distinctive work? Saving or redeeming. He's the Redeemer. And then the Holy Spirit's distinctive work? Comfort. Yeah, He's the Sanctifier. He's the one that makes holy. So how does He make us holy? by bringing us to the Son who restores us to right relationship with the Father. And, and that's being expressed here. He will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. And then what, what is Christ? All that he has is also the Father's. The Father gives gifts to the Son, and then the, the Spirit makes those gifts known to us. And this is why, especially in the Lutheran Church, again, a charge that's, also, that's often leveled against us, we don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and here, we're, we're, this isn't the only place. Several times in this discourse with his disciples, Jesus has said the same thing regarding the Holy Spirit's unique role in highlighting Christ bringing the attention, bringing people's attention to Christ and to His work of redemption. The Holy Spirit doesn't want the spotlight on Himself. He wants it shining on Jesus. So it's a bit like uh, a, a met, you know, someone running in, 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 into the room and telling you, uh, guess what, uh, you know, so-and-so just won the 100-meter dash in the Olympics. And so, really, and then we, 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 we take a medal and we put it on that guy that just told us that. Oh. <laughs> you don't do that. See? But that's what we're doing if we put the emphasis on the Holy Spirit who wants us to know more than anything 
what Jesus did on the cross. He wants the glory to go to Jesus. He will glorify me. That's what it says. He will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. Um, and and this, this glorification business, throughout the Gospel of John, what has Jesus been teaching his disciples regarding the moment of his glory? When is it that Jesus is glorified? And that this... And, and I'm asking specifically about After his death. The, the, the Gospel of John. It, it's not that there aren't other answers that are true, but that the Gospel of John wants us to know this is the moment of his glorification. I'm going to say on the cross. cross. On the cross. Yeah. On the cross. See, we expect the answer to be his resurrection, mm -hmm. his ascension. Mm -hmm. but, but no, in, in John... The moment of glory is his dying on the cross. So, for example, you, you have um, in that conversation with Nicodemus back in John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. It's been a while, so maybe we've forgotten. But you'll re recall that Jesus uses an example from the Israelites' experience in the wilderness. The whole business of the, the snake put on the, the snakes that were... That were, that were biting and killing the, the unfaithful Israelites. And so uh, Moses interceded on their behalf and God uh, made a way for them not to die uh, from these snake bites. And it was to have a, a bronze serpent put on a pole. Um, so it says in um, four, three, four. Verse, yeah, 3 verse 14, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So, very literally, a serpent was lifted up, or a bronze serpent was lifted up on a pole. But notice what the analogy is. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. And when will that happen? How will that happen? On the cross. On the cross. Also a kind of pole. <clears throat> But that's also, and so you have almost a pun, a play on words or a double meaning in that, he, you know, what, what is it to exalt someone? Lift it's to up. lift them up. And, and he will be exalted when he is literally lifted up about three feet from the ground. Why? Why is that the moment of glory for Jesus? Yeah, that's when the sacrifice becomes real. This becomes the completion of the, the work the Father gave him to do. He was obedient even unto death. So that his task, you, you, you might say, was to glorify us. By being lifted up on the cross, that was our means of glorification of having glory restored to man made in the image of God, but who had fallen. And now by taking our place, becoming our substitute, sacrificing himself for us, he in that way glorifies us, which is what the Father wanted him to do to begin with. And so in that way, Jesus also glorifies the Father and himself. For him to, to earn glory, he must do that which brings glory to us, which was the plan of salvation. And now, now the Holy Spirit comes and brings glory to Jesus by, among other things, bringing people to faith in this one who was lifted up. And at the same time, that same message, as we've just gotten done uh, hearing from Jesus, convicts the world. The world had put... Jesus on trial, and yet that whole time, Jesus' death on the cross serves to put the world on trial. And everything from a human perspective looks as though Jesus is being God at. And yet it's Jesus getting the world. 
And the Holy Spirit comes and convicts the world of sin for rejecting Jesus, righteousness for calling Jesus the unrighteous one when he was the only righteous one, and, and for judgment. They thought they were judging the world. They thought God was judging Jesus. And far from it, that ends up being judgment on them. Judgment is now heaped on them for doing what they did to Christ. Remember that? That was maybe the focus last week of, of those words, uh, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right? E everything they thought was true of Jesus ends up being not true, and therefore actually true of them and of us. We're the sinners. We're the unrighteous ones. We're the ones who fall under judgment. And all because Jesus on the cross was himself without sin, actually righteous, and the judgment by God was ultimately innocent. We know that because he was raised from the dead. So, so now all that is brought, so, so that, that gospel message, that good news of what Jesus has done, serves also as, as condemnation for those who refuse to believe it, who reject it. So anything about that, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's the last thing we, we talked about uh, before um, ending class last time. Okay, uh, 16, before we dive into 16, we do well to remember what the church is. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, about the church. What is the church? Group of believers. All right, group of believers. Group of believers. The body of Christ. Body of Christ. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it this way. H Holy Spirit, we're, we've just been told, uh, will glorify Jesus. Uh, he will... Uh, Take what is Jesus and declare it to us. What is the Holy Spirit's theater of operations? Church. Church. And when we say that, what do we mean by church? See, see I want to, want to narrow our understanding, put, put a finer point on this, the church. His field of operations is the church. The bridegroom of Christ. Okay. But believers in Christ, can I see your belief? No. So, so if, if one wants to encounter this Christ that the Holy Spirit uh, declares to, to, to people, that brings to people... How do I know where to go? The church proclaims the gospel. Aha! Okay. Do you hear the difference? The church proclaims the gospel. So now we, we, we've got a, a, a different working definition. The church isn't so much the group of believers. I can't see your belief. You can't see mine. But what can we see or what can we hear? The gospel being proclaimed. So where is the church? Where the gospel is being proclaimed and where the sacraments are being administered. This is what the Holy Spirit uniquely attaches himself to and works through to do this work that Jesus says the Spirit is all about, bringing Christ to people. It, that's very important. Um, that, that very word church in Greek I mean, it, it, it's, it's a word that, that the Greek language already had and, and, and used primarily in, in civic settings or political settings. An assembly called out once. But the church is most the church when it's gathered together around the proclamation of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. So... Does the Holy Spirit work through the words of the Bible? Absolutely. And yet, you, you didn't really have the Bible in everybody's house 
until maybe the 1700s. That's just not a thing for 1,700 years. Was the Holy Spirit not working in the days before the Bible of course. What was a, you know, a, a common coffee table book or, or, or a book to stash your valuables in? You know, how, however people use the Bible in the home. Uh, Gather dust. Collecting dust. Yeah, dust collector. Something like that. Door jam. Paperweight. Uh, no, no. But the gospel was proclaimed all those years in the context of believers gathering around the word, around the apostles' teachings and the administration of the sacraments. And so most especially the, the, the entrance into uh, that life of, with Christ begins with baptism. Peter at, at Pentecost, 10 days after our Lord ascends, says in answer to the question, brothers, what must we do? Peter's just convicted them of having crucified the Son of God. And, and, and that they were wrong in their judgment of, of, of him is proved by the fact he has risen from the grave. And so this cuts them to the heart and they cry out, brothers, what must we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to us in our baptism. And that Holy Spirit sanctifies us, makes us holy by creating faith in the one who was lifted up for us on the cross. What, 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 one more thing to say. This is going backwards just a little bit. But, but it, it's worth saying. Um, I, I told Bruce this uh, a few days ago. Came across, it's, it's been, a, it, it's, it's been a, a, a while back, but uh, this was actually some, a, a way that uh, yeah, Pastor Dalthwaite's uncle put it in, in an essay he wrote uh, for, uh, I think, the World Magazine, the uh, World and I, World Magazine. Um, but, but, but Pastor Dalthwaite, not, not our Pastor Dalthwaite, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Dalthwaite, right, in Virginia, he said, uh, the, the, the question he began the essay with was, do you think of the Christian religion as a matter of drawing God into your life or as God drawing you into His? And see, Jesus right here in John is saying the whole reason He's come He's been sent by the Father to draw people into God's life. Yeah. And that's a huge difference. Because, I mean, think of the whole Gospel of John as teaching, making this point. <clears throat> that over and over again, people who quote-unquote believe in Jesus really only see Jesus as a means of them getting more of the stuff they really like on earth. More bread, more fish, more health, more success. And Jesus didn't come to give them that. Jesus came to give them something much, much greater. See, because what is God? We, we ended last class talking about this. God is the only being whose existence is not dependent. Everything else that exists depends on its even existing, much less continuing to exist, on God himself. But God's life is eternal. It doesn't need anything else for it to do as it does, which is exist forever. I am who I am. No, no one else can say that. No other God can say that. Every other God is a God who wasn't. A God who ain't. God is, God is. You can simply say that. None of the rest of us can say that about ourselves. That we are in a, we exist in a qualified way. That, that, that I am up until I'm not. Which, you know, for some of us may be a few years, some of us may be, you know, 10 years, 15, whatever. But not with God. God's life is an eternal life. 
And what's he doing? He's drawing you into his. This perfect, unending life. That's what he wants to do. Not simply be your, you know, uh, prolong your life a few more years. Give, give, give you, you know, just a few more really, really great meals or something like that. No, no. He wants to give you his kind of life, which is eternal. Uh, so, again, Holy Spirit works through the church, the church being that place where, or where uh, the, the gospel is proclaimed and the sacraments administered. So, so you see there's kind of, uh, you, you ever hear the distinction made between the, the church visible and the church invisible? Right? So, the, the, the church invisible, it's invisible because it's comprised of people that believe. And belief is something that can't be seen. And, and so on any given Sunday, you look out, and you don't know for sure That's right. that everyone there isn't pretending. But there is kind of a visible boundary of, of where those people ex are, are to be found, and that visible boundary is where the word is being preached and, and the sacraments administered. In other words, this is what makes people become people of faith. These are the means. This is what, what, what Jesus has attached his promise to, such that people are made members of the church. So the church, the, the, the church doesn't make itself, or the, or, or the people, uh, believers don't, don't make the church. They comprise the church. They constitute the church. But who makes the church? The Holy Spirit does. You, you, you follow that? Okay, and that, that, that's all important to appreciating what's coming next in the discourse from Jesus. All right, any, any questions about that? I mean, we're, we're, again, third article of the Creed. You know, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, but the Holy Spirit has called me. And where does the Holy Spirit do that? He does it uh, through, through the preaching of the gospel and, and, and baptism and Lord's Supper and so forth. Um, okay, verse 16. A little while and you'll see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us a little while and you'll not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father... So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Now, just in case, it, it's, it's subtle here, but d does anyone know what the disciples are questioning among themselves? What, 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 what is it that puzzles them? What does it mean? A little while, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It only shows up three times. But, but in case you missed it, <laughs> um, that's, that's what the disciples are concerned about. What does he mean by a little while you won't see me and a little while you will see me? Okay, just in case you missed that, uh, John only quotes it three times. Uh, I, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course. But, but, uh, but obviously, John writes it that way to make it abundantly clear this is important and that this is, this is, off, you know, is he, even, is he having fun with that? You, you know, if, how many times does he have to say it for, to get the point across? Um, so in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. 
Okay. So, I suppose we have two options for understanding what he means by a little while you won't see me, a little while again, and you will. But only one of them can be true. And we'll see why. What, 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 what might be the two references here? What, what's one not seeing me and seeing me again? Death, Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Yeah. So in a little while you won't see me because I'm going to die on the cross. A little while again you will see me because he's going to be raised from the dead and he'll appear to his disciples. Mm -hmm. But what's another option? Ascension. The second ascension. Coming? Aha. So ascension. A little while you won't see me because he will ascend mm -hmm. into the heavens. But then you'll see me again because he will return. Second coming. How can we know it's not the second one that he's talking about here? I know, I know. Sarah? <laughs> because we learned this the other day. I was like shocked. Because he says he's going to the Father and he doesn't go to the Father until he ascends, right? Is that it? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, although that's good. We, 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 got, we got to come back to that. We, got, we, we, we have to... Because I go to the Father, that, that's a very important part of this. But what else does he say about their reaction to his not being seen? Oh, about being sad. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we happen. know what they were when he died on the cross. They were sorrowful. Mm -hmm. How about when he ascended? No, they're not. They weren't. On the, on, on, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, look at uh, the end of Luke where you have the account of the uh, resurrection. <laughs> or, I mean, the account of the ascension. It says uh, in verse, this is Luke 24 and verse 50. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands he blessed them. While he blessed them he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So it, it, it's not this not seeing him because this not seeing him they reacted to with joy. No, no, it's the, oh thank you so much, it's, it's the uh, not seeing him when he died on the cross and, and that we have plenty of examples that are gathered in the upper room for fear, uh, the, um, the, the, the meeting of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and, and, and how they lost hope, they say, to Jesus, not knowing that it was Jesus at first. That was the... the and, and we also know this, how the world react when Jesus died on the cross. What kinds of things do we see the, the unbelieving world say and do as Jesus hung on the cross? Yeah. Yeah. They're 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 mocking him, wagging their their fingers at him. Uh, he trusted in him. Let him deliver him if he's the son of God. All all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, making fun of him as he uh, is in agony. Um, save yourself. Save yourself. Right. Exactly. If if you are the son of God. Uh, the, the, the one thief uh, uh, ridicule him ridiculing him as well um, so the, 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 they're going to go through this this period of sorrow and, and, and yet they have this wonderful promise that their sorrow will turn into joy as we know it did we know how in the upper room when uh, he said peace be with them uh, then all of a sudden these, these fearful disciples uh, were were glad uh, they, 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 they were they were made uh, they were made happy to, to recognize that Christ had indeed risen from the dead um, and and so even when he uh, was ascended that leaving them that uh, uh, leaving their sight we might say uh, did not cause them sorrow but rather joy and we've talked about this before because this theme has come up in a different way already in the same discourse. Why? Why did the ascension not cause them sorrow? 
Yeah, maybe, maybe, but not just that it, it, it meant he would return for sure, but, but what, what do we say the ascension inaugurates in terms of Jesus' mode of being with, be with his church? He'll be everywhere. He'll be everywhere now. That, that Christ is, is, is no longer confined to one particular place in time such that, you know, to, to, to get to Jesus, we'd have to take a plane to Jerusalem or uh, go to his website and see what his tour dates are. Um, <laughs> or tickets through Ticketmaster or something. No, no, no. Now, now the exalted Christ who is no longer in his state of humility, his uh, state of uh, humiliation, or that is to say, uh, no longer confining himself and not exercising his, his full divine power at all times. Now he is. And so now he can make, he is at the right hand of God. Where, where's that? Everywhere. It, you know, it, it's not some place, you know, just beyond the seventh cloud to the left. God's right hand is wherever God is, 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 is working on behalf of his church. And so that's everywhere Jesus is. Because he's at that right hand. And so now Jesus is available to all of Christendom, spread all over the world at all times. And they, and they already understood that? I, I think so. I, I think so. I, I think they're finally piecing together these things that he told them before. And remember, what else was the promise? That there's some things they can't bear yet. But what would happen? The Holy Spirit would come and, and bring them to remembrance and, and, and then teach them all things, all things. And, and you've got those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension where Jesus is doing more teaching. And he taught the, you know, he, he, to the disciples on at Emmaus, he opened the scriptures to them, beginning with Moses. And so he ex explained, and, and then Luke just doesn't tell us everything he taught them in that, that Bible class. Oh, if only he had. But, but we, we, we can piece together what, what some of it must have been from the Apostles' writings. You know, there, there, there are things in the letters of Paul and John and, and Peter that, that teach us, and especially Acts, when we hear the first of preaching of the Apostles, these are the kinds of things the Apostles have learned since his... His resurrection. I like I like the term "bring to remembrance" because doesn't that kind of work with, that way with us as well? When yeah. We've heard something since we were kids, right? And one day it just N it hits you. Yeah, now now it hits us in a way. Yeah, it was there all along. Yeah, yeah, but right. It, it didn't register. Right, for some reason. right. Well, that's that's interesting what you said, Bruce, because in the Old Testament, uh, it was remember. Remember, yeah. remember. Right. And so in the New Testament, it again, it's remember. Yeah. That's, and so much of what Jesus taught them had to do with seeing him as the fulfillment of the things they should have been remembering from the Old Testament. Right? Um, so, a little while they'll not see me, and again a lot, little while and you, you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father... Now, uh, throughout the, the book Gospel of John, this idea has, has, has been present. Going back again to that Nicodemus exchange, uh, look at that verse just before the one we looked at earlier, John 3, verse 13. Uh, but, but how many times we, we, we see something like this um, but, but Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, so forth. But all along, the, the, the story has been, we have this one who has come down who will inevitably go back up. And, and so, but for him to go back up, he must first complete the mission. And the mission is to die on the cross for the sins of the world. So, he's not going to be here for a little while, then he will be here. 
And this is all for the sake of completing the mission that he might go back to the Father. A anything about that? See how it all fits? What, 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 he, what, he's, what he's telling the disciples now? And, and then, you know, the, these words, while, while they, they meant specifically this event, the crucifixion and then the resurrection, for the disciples who first heard it, we can, by analogy, see it as, as speaking even to us today, his disciples today, that we know Jesus kept his promise. We know he fulfilled all that he was sent to do on our behalf to win us back to, to, to his Father. And so now we have this little while between our having been brought to faith in Christ, being put into this new life and, and, and experiencing the final fulfillment of it with our Lord's second coming. And so uh, I refer you to, to Sunday's sermon. <laughs> I, I don't know what, what else I can... I, I don't want to just repeat myself uh, from, from something you heard just a few days ago. But, but, but that, that idea. Yeah, it was... It was uh, Oh, actually, yeah, Joyce, you'll appreciate it. So I, I, get a, uh, I get a text from Polly, and she sends me a picture of Vlad and Meredith. Oh, really? Yeah, the other day. And, uh, and so I'm it's Vlad and Meredith. And, and, uh, and, and, and she, she works some kind of, um, well, I, I'd asked her for pictures from, from way back when we were in college, because uh, I'm going to use them for my sip and read. And, she, and, and, she's, and I said something like, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it feels like just yesterday. That, that, you know, we're walking to church as college students, right, passing the, the Make Way for Ducklings uh, statues. <laughs> and, uh, and so she then quoted something from her pastor's sermon that day, which might as well have been from mine, because he, he went the same direction with it. He talked more in terms of telescoping, that, 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 that uh, you know, in, in terms of a sense of time. See, when you look through a telescope, right, you know, the star that is, in actual fact, light years away from the star in front of it, you know, looks to be just right behind it. You know, just right behind it. And that's kind of the, the, the prophet's view of things and how when they talk about the, the, the work of salvation and the Messiah coming, they can go straight from... The, the, the suffering servant uh, dying for the lost sheep to new creation and into the world. You know, back to back. You know, that, that, that's, Isaiah reads like that. What, what one leads inevitably into the other as if there's really no interval. Well, that would be Isaiah's perspective. You know, as a prophet looking on 800 years ahead of time, ah, is, is death and resurrection, and then the, the new heaven and the new earth, the one is just behind the other. But we who are living out the days in between, it feels like forever. Uh, it turns out there's, there's more distance between them than, than would seem to be the case from Isaiah's perspective. But whose perspective is, is truer? Isaiah's. Because that's, that's God's perspective. It is just a, a little while. And, and whether that second coming is tomorrow or a thousand years from now, uh, the, the, the joy that we will know in that new heaven and the new earth will have us forget just how long we had to wait. Uh, almost immediately. right? And the, the, the trial and the tribulation that we went through, that anguish will, will be washed away. And for, for the joy that, that we'll now know and, and that joy that we'll only know. It'll only be joy uh, in, in that new heaven, that new creation. Uh, so moving in, into what's new for us, verse 23, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So we're, we're back to a topic we've had before, which is prayer. Right. Now, our English translations make this trickier to understand than it should be. 
And I'm really going to test you here, because I've gone over this before. <laughs> uh, let me see if any of you remember this. Or maybe, maybe you, you made notes and, and, and it's written in the margins or something. First of all, what's confusing about what Jesus says here? Ask anything. Like you'll get anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, well, let's put that problem aside. Let's put that problem aside. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't ask me for anything anymore. Yeah, in that day, yeah, you'll 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 ask nothing, nothing of me. Nothing, right. yeah. nothing in my name. Yeah. <laughs> but truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. And, and until now, you've asked nothing in my name. So, <laughs> what, what does that sound like? Is there not a kind of contradiction, or or, or it seems that this this can't be? He's, he's introducing the Trinity. Okay, the, 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 the Trinity, absolutely. That, 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 that's a, a key point in this, for sure. That's right. But, but what about the, the asking business? Well, is he only talking about prayer there? Is he talking about like asking for those, those preparing the upper room or getting the donkey? Is they're talking about that kind of asking? Or did he okay, the all right. You're, you're on the right track. <laughs> so so here's, here's the problem. Our English translators, for some reason have decided to translate two different words with the same word. So the first ask, and, and, and let me verify, because I, I guess I haven't done this in a while. Let's see, John 16, 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the, the <laughs> erao verb, okay? And then... Yep, it's a completely different verb in, in the second half. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask, I pace I take. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different verb. Here, here's the difference between those two verbs. The first verb is, a, is, an, is an inquiry. It, it's, it's asking for information. The second asking is a request. The two Greek words mean two different things. So it'd almost be better, and I wonder if, if some translations do this. Oh, it, come to find out. I remember bringing this up in a, in a Bible class where you had uh, Curtis and Maria, and Maria brought up the fact that it is in the Spanish translation two different verbs. And that the Spanish words that are chosen correspond to inquiring, uh, asking, you know, a, an inquiry like, what is your name? Who are you? That's an inquiry. A request is, give me your hat. Could, 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 I, could I borrow your umbrella? That's a request. Hear the difference? And so what he's saying here, this is partly a promise. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. In other words, they will reach a point where they get it themselves. You will inquire nothing. You, you won't inquire. You, you, you won't have any more questions that need answering like you do now. What does he mean? What does he mean by a little while? What does he mean by going to the Father? In that day, you're not going to have questions like that anymore. He's already told them. The Holy Spirit's going to teach them all things. However, they will continue to need things and now he's telling them, you'll be able to ask the Father for those things that you need in my name. In my name. You hear the difference? I almost think it would serve the purpose, because he's just gotten done dealing with this question. Oh, what do you mean by in a little while you won't see me? What do you mean by, right, over and over again? And he's saying there's going to come a time where you're not going to be ignorant. And, and, and need to ask for clarification. However, he moves to kind of a, almost a new point in, in the next verse with this, in that day, you'll have the confidence to go to my Father in my name and ask whatever you want. And it's unfortunate because the translators choose to translate these two different words, both with the word ask. It sounds like these two verses are connected in a way that they aren't. 
there, there are almost two different points. That one is that the end of your ignorance is coming. And in that day, you'll be able to go to my Father with whatever you need and pray in the confidence that comes with having been adopted into God's family. Everybody follow that? Uh, so notice, um, so, so you won't have to inquire. You, you'll inquire nothing of me. You won't have any of these informational questions anymore. And truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, they'll give it to you. So what does in my name mean? We, we've done this exercise not, not that long ago. Because he's, he's, he's said this before. What is it to, to ask to pray in Jesus' name? Maybe it's directly go to the Father. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. But it's still going to the Father through Jesus. Does it mean... Uh, this is a, a silly way of asking it, but does it mean every time we pray, we have to use those exact words in Jesus' name? No. 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 And we often do. A lot of our prayers in church, I think our, probably our private prayers, we, we, we might end with in Jesus' name, amen. But, but that's not what he's saying. It's not like an abracadabra magic word or magic phrase that opens things up that otherwise wouldn't. It, it, it means something. You, you, you can pray in Jesus' name without saying the words in Jesus' name. Does it mean How so? His will? Ah, okay, according to his will? Is it? Possibly. Is it like you told us a while back about <clears throat> sending a, uh, a, um, a king sending an emissary? Yes. To to right, that. right. To pray in Jesus' name <clears throat> means to ask for things with the same authority that Jesus has to ask for things. So, who alone has the right to ask God the Father for anything? Jesus, Jesus does. He has that right by nature. He is God's Son by nature. So, of course, Jesus can ask His Father for whatever He wants. But what gives us the right? To approach God the Father that way. We've been adopted into Jesus. Yeah. Well, yeah. We are united with Christ. So Christ has given us the privilege that is only His by nature. We now have it by adoption. But wow, what a privilege. Yeah. A privilege that we, we don't take advantage of as often as we should. But, but to know that God hears our prayers as though they were coming from Jesus himself. We can go boldly to the throne We can go boldly, yeah. Access to the throne of grace with boldness. That's why in the, in the catechism, what does it mean, our Father who art in heaven? That, that we should believe that he is our dear Father and we are his dear children and should therefore ask him with all boldness and confidence as children ask their Father. Yes. You know, a side, <clears throat> side note to that, you know, especially when we have company over and we pray, when it's just Mike and I, I may just say amen, but when we have company over and I really don't know where they are with their faith, I say, in Jesus' name, I pray amen. Yeah. Or if you're in some sort of public place and there's a prayer, yeah. I'm looking for them to say, in Jesus' name, because I want to make sure we're praying to the right God. Right. And I just say, dear Lord, dear right. God, who knows what that's going exactly. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like prayer and, and remember, it's your house, yeah. so your guests are stuck with having to listen to a prayer to your God. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when you're at their house, you suffer, I suppose. Um, their house, their rules. Their house, their suffer. rules, that's right. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, Christian prayers should sound different than other religions' prayers and the world's prayers. Because we're praying to the Heavenly Father through Christ. I mean, what, one of the acknowledgments that we're making in every prayer, whether we state it explicitly or not, is that I do not, of myself, deserve to come before God's heavenly throne. 
Because I of myself, without Christ, am a sinner. And my sin uh, coming into contact with God's holiness means I get vaporized. And yet, here we are as Christians, daring to, to, to tread, tread the ground that, that God walks on. How so? Because Christ has given us by grace this privilege to approach Him as He Himself gets to approach Him. So, it, it's... Uh, see, I, I, I was talking to Pastor Douthwaite earlier this week about this kind of dilemma that... Um, you know, I, I, I know of, of... Well, I have a pastor friend who has a, a, a fella in his, in his school that for whatever reason, the school sometimes, that this particular principal gets to lead assemblies at the, the nearest um, public school. And so he has a scruple. He, he will not pray the Lord's Prayer in those contexts. Uh, uh, other Christian leaders that come do it without, you know, have no problem with that, but, but he does. And what, what, what's his reason? He says, the Lord's Prayer is a prayer given to the baptized. That, that, that not everybody gets to call him our Father. We get to call him our Father through Jesus. And so Jesus gives his disciples, who are his disciples, those who have been made his disciples by baptism. The baptized get to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so what are you suggesting by leading an assembly of, who knows? Yeah. Baptized and unbaptized, but saying, oh, you don't really need baptism. You don't really need to be connected to Jesus to, to approach God's throne of grace and expect Him to hear your prayer and answer it. Yes, yes you do. Without Christ, you are still in your sins. God doesn't hear the prayer of sinners. This is said over and over again in His Word. But He hears the prayers of those that have been made right with Him through Christ. And, and that's... You know, our Father who art in heaven. Who's the our? Baptized believers. Well, who who taught the prayer? Jesus. 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 Jesus, did. Jesus and my Father in heaven. Get it? Our Father. Jesus and I. The our is Jesus and me. Together he's our Father. But he's not mine by myself. He's only my Father by Jesus joining Himself to me. And so, so, so you, you see the dilemma. You know, to the extent I find that scruple compelling, that, that you're misleading people mm -hmm. by praying the Lord's Prayer in just any particular, in any setting. You know, especially if you pray it and invite others to join you. See? Uh, others who, who may not, who, who could be Muslim, could, but whatever. Uh, well, we have a school, and, a, and our school is comprised of everybody. Lutherans, non-Lutherans, Christians, non-Christians. And we have chapel every week. So I go back, it's, it's well, the, tr the school is an extension of the home, not the church. It's, it's, it belongs to the economic estate, the, the household. And... House rules. <laughs> See? Right. House rules. So, um, anyway, but, but, but at least that's my, rash, my current rationalization. <laughs> uh, until I come up with a better one. Pastor? Yeah. To get us off on a tangent a little bit, now we're kind of about, talking about what counts and what doesn't count. I was in Michigan this past weekend and my son goes to a non denom And um, they had the big baptismal. It was Big Baptism Sunday where they yeah. did the dunking and you know, but some people have testimonies that are beautiful and all that stuff. Yeah. But before, I thought, what I've never heard this explained before, but before the pastor did all that, this woman who must be in charge of everyone getting ready for the baptism, she says, you know, anyone can come up. Um, it's, it's to proclaim your faith in Jesus. You know, there's nothing mystical about it. There's no... It, it, she, the way she explained it, she basically, as far as I was concerned, kind of denounced the creation of faith and the mystical part of baptism yes. by the Father. Yeah. So then, what make, I never thought of this until you're talking now, what counts, what doesn't count. Yeah. Does a baptism like that 
count when you yeah. just feel, you know, he did say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they go, you know, back and right. up and all that stuff. Right. And it is a beautiful ceremony if right. you want to talk about beautiful. Yeah. But if they're denouncing the creation of faith, which is right. by the yeah. Father, does that count? I, I think we, we would in most cases say yes, that, that they, <laughs> they still, the, the baptism was still performed in the way Jesus commanded us to perform it. Water was applied, and the words that Jesus himself gave us to say were said, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's good, because these people were very sincere. Yeah, and now, that, but, but, but now they have to be untaught everything that was said about it yeah. in, in the same context. I found that disturbing. Yeah, and I hear stories like this more and more yeah. of... Um, well, attended uh, one of our, our school children's uh, baptism at a non-denominational church. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was like five minutes of, of the, the worship leader or the pastor of the church assuring everyone that nothing's about to happen. Yeah, like they're making excuses. Yeah, right. Now, I just, just want to make, make, make sure everybody's on the same page here. What, what, what's about to happen really doesn't do anything. Yeah, and, and it's just, like a proclamation. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just I mean, of course, that's their teaching, but but it, it it's remarkable to me how important it is for them to get that across. You know, uh, the the non-denominational pastor protests too much, me thinks. Yeah. You know what I say? Yeah. I wonder why he's going to so much trouble to assure the people baptism doesn't save you. Could that be because God's own word says baptism saves you? Yeah. yeah. Just in case anyone out there believes what scripture says, I want to assure you, Peter didn't know what he was writing at that point. He was on, I don't know, meth or something when he, when he wrote that verse. Because we all know it doesn't. No. Yeah. And, that's, and, and that ultimately undermines grace alone. It's a gift. You're passive in the event. You are baptized. Passive voice. You receive this. This is how the gospel gets brought to you. You know, how many times, you know, to make the point that um, uh, Christ's death and resurrection happened 2,000 years ago. What does it have to do with me? That, that, that's just an historical fact. How do I get... Con That's the power of salvation. But that power is no good for anyone unless it's given to you. You're connected to it. It's like I have all kinds of foods in my pantry. They just sit there. They have the potential of nourishing me, but only when... That food meets my stomach. <laughs> See? And so how does Jesus' death and resurrection meet our life? It's brought to us in baptism. It's connected to us in baptism. I'm going to talk more about this in, in the, you know, because we're, we're at the First Peter 3 section on, uh, in, on Sunday with baptism now saves you. But, you know, you, you have sins. Where do I take those sins? To Calvary? Can't get there. We don't even know where Calvary is. You know, if you go do a Holy Land tour, you know, some uh, entrepreneurs yeah. are going to say it was here. Other entrepreneurs will say it was there. But, but even if we could be sure this was the spot, to take your sins there all you want, ain't nothing going to happen. <clears throat> ah, but Calvary gets brought to you in your baptism. Take your sins to baptism. Your baptism washes them away because Jesus attaches the power of his resurrection to it, as 1 Peter says. That, that, that kind of thing. Um, and, and see, that, that, that gives, that, that's giving you your identity, your baptismal identity, that, that this is who I truly am, this, and this is how I know. I was baptized. A promise was made to me in my baptism, Jesus' own words. And, and, and now we live in that, that assurance that I belong to a God who has decided to love me no matter what. I am baptized. I am baptized. And I, I, don't, I don't see how that is at all a contradiction of grace alone. It's grace alone. 
He didn't have to baptize me. He didn't have to bring his death and resurrection to me, but he did. And, 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 and in a way that is universal. Again, the, the point, why might he have chosen water? Because where there's water, or let's say, <laughs> where there is people, there is water. And if there's no water, there's no people. Because he wants to make this available to everyone. He wants the whole world to be saved. Or we, we, you could say, you know, the, the Old Testament Israelites, the, the, the firstborn was circumcised on the eighth day, brought into the covenant on the eighth day of his life. So now we have a situation where Jesus comes, dies and rises for the whole world. Oh, eight-day-olds can't be baptized. They've got to wait. So we go from the Old Testament being more inclusive than the new. How backwards is that? Is that just me finding that scandalous? That, oh yeah, God was much more gracious in the Old Testament days. He let people as young as eight days, but now you got to wait. Now that Jesus has come, you got to wait and get credible evidence of your faith, be able to articulate and explain it, and then we'll baptize you. Huh? So we're adding barriers to this thing rather than removing them. We're going in the wrong direction, folks, if we're going to be consistent with who Jesus has presented himself to be. In, 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 okay, all right, that's enough. <laughs> Don't get me started. You, you, you know if you bring up baptism, you're going to get... This is why I'm a Lutheran. Yeah. This is why I'm a Lutheran. Yeah, I was, I was reading uh, Augustus Hodges, who, who's 18th century Baptist theologian. And I want to say, what, what, what are these people's arguments? And uh, they... they his Greek is bad. I mean, he's, just, he's making Greek arguments that just aren't, you know, anyone who knows Greek says, no, that, that's not how the Greek works, no. right? And, and so he says, you know, obviously you, you, you have to wait because what does Jesus say? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And he says, see, they've got to be disciples first and then you baptize and teach them. Well, if they're not made disciples by baptizing, and if they're not made disciples by teaching them, how do they ever get to be disciples? See, he, he's reading it as a sequence. Yeah. Make disciples. Whereas everybody that knows how to speak English knows baptizing and teaching is how you do it. You make disciples of all nations by baptizing them and teaching them. And, and the other thing that, that tells me Hodges doesn't know his Greek, <laughs> baptizing them, the them has to go back to nations. There is no word disciples in the Greek. There's only one noun in, in the phrase that leads, you know, make disciples of all nations. In the Greek, it's, it's a verb that means disciplize. And disciplize is kind of clunky, kind of science fiction-y, I guess. So what, are, what are English translators make disciples. But it's not like there's a word make and a word disciples in the Greek. It's just this one word, a verb, disciplize. Disciplize what? All nations. So the only thing the pronoun them can refer back to, it's got to be a noun. Pronouns don't stand in the place of verbs. They're not proverbs. They're pronouns. Pro -proverbs. Go to Solomon for your proverbs. They're pronouns. So what's the only noun that's been in the sentence prior that it could be going back to? All nations. And so he says, there's no explicit command to baptize infants. Well, there ain't no explicit command to baptize adults. But there's all nations, and why would you leave children out of that? When, when the Old Testament, the, the Old Covenant didn't, but now the new one does? So just... <laughs> that was how you really feel. But, 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 you know, but, but we, I, I feel like we're, we're defensive yeah. in this area, this land of no sacraments called Dallas. <laughs> and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. The devil is in this. 
separating people from their baptism. Because what have you left with? If, if baptism isn't, as Jesus himself says, the means by which he, you get connected to him, then now what are you relying on? You're relying on your feeling, a decision you made, you're relying on yourself. How do you know that you're saved? I believe. Well, what do you believe? Well, I believe that I believe. Exactly. See? But baptism makes the object of our faith Jesus. How do you know that, that you're saved? I was baptized. I was baptized. And Jesus came to me. Anyway, all right, all right. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move into uh, this, this wonderful little exchange where the disciples claim to have gotten it already. <laughs> and Jesus says, oh, really? We'll see about that. Um, but uh, maybe the best note to end on is that, this, that your joy may be full. That your, this is what our Lord came to give us. Again, that whole business of he didn't come to, to, to give us a little bit more of the, the, the things in this earthly life that we want more of. No, no, no. He came to make it so that we can participate in his eternal joy-filled existence. And, and, and that's a theme that's been running through the whole Gospel of John from the beginning. What's his first sign? What's his first sign? And I think there's, there's a significance to this. The wedding. The, 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 the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. What's that all about? Joy. Joy. Abundance. That, 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 that this Jesus has come to, to bring back to, to the world something that it sorely lacks. Joy. Joy. He's not above going to a wedding reception, going to a wedding party where there's much, much joy. And when something stands in the way of that joy, he fixes it right away. That your joy may be full. So, so when we see that, it ought not surprise us. John's been, been, been preparing us for this all along the way. That he's the joy bringer. He's the joy bringer, Jesus is. But he has to bring it at the expense of his own life, which will for a little while bring sorrow. But only for a little while. There's, there's, a, there's an expiration date on that sorrow. And after that, only joy. Only joy. Full joy. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that your son Jesus was obedient to, to you, uh, even uh, to death on the cross, so that he might bring us life and salvation and joy to the full. Uh, help us even in this life know that that joy is ours uh, through your son Jesus. And may we reflect it in the way that we serve and, and love one another so that uh, even uh, the church's enemies uh, may be uh, won over uh, to the gospel and be able to share with us in the peace and joy that Jesus brings us. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.